Hello friends. My name's Smelly Goat, and I thought I would just put a face to the words every now and then and thought I would introduce myself and say hello. Thanks for stopping by and thanks for taking some of my words in, which are a mix of my own and others' words and the synthesis that that's created in myself. I've spent the last five years writing and making my art to no acclaim. That's fine. I've just been kind of journaling with different forms of media over the last five years. And today I'm doing a reading um, of one of my favorite authors, Walt Whitman who I think we need a lot more of and need to be reminded of his words today. Uh, I've really been enjoying spending some time over the last six months with Walt Whitman, his famous Leaves of Grass, left a huge mark on the world. And I think it's interesting to hear some of his thoughts about his writing. I think with all the anger rising in the world today, it's good to reflect on and remember those who preached love into the world or brought love into the world. I call them prophets of love. Walt Whitman was a prophet of love. Epictetus, the Stoics even, I feel were prophets of love. Rumi, also a great prophet of love, someone I'll be reading more of. So I'm gonna start near the end of the book Page 179, Immortality. There are senses in which we do not know. I know and I don't know. I believe in immortality, and by that I mean identity. I know I have arrived at this result more by what may be called feeling than formal reason, but I believe it, yes, I know it. I am easily put to flight, I assure you, when attacked, but I return to the faith inevitably, believe it and stick to it to the end. Emerson somewhere speaks of encountering irresistible logic and yet standing fast to his conviction. There is judgment back of judgment. Defeat only seems like defeat. There is a fierce fight. The smoke is gone. Your enemies are nowhere to be seen. You are placidly victorious after all. The finish of the day is yours. Logic does very little for me. My enemies say it meaning one thing. I say it meaning another thing. Schiller's idea is the only one for modern science, that if it is right, immortality will come. If not right, not. Page 181. My philosophy. I am more likely to have feeling than theories about things. I was never a man to drive doctrines to death, to take up with fads, special providences, whims of diet or manners. The last thing the world needs is a cut and dried philosophy, and that last man to announce a cut and dried philosophy would be Walt Whitman. Why, boy, there's just the secret of it, which you have always so well grasped, including all philosophies, as I do. How could I nail myself to any one or single specimen, except it to be this, only, that my philosophy is to include all other philosophies? My philosophy sees a place and a time for everybody, even Judas Iscariot, Yes, for all, all of us are parties to the same bargain. The worst, the best, the middling, all parties to the same bargain. That is my contention, not to make wholesale comparisons, draw rigid lines, put everybody into a scale, try every man by a tape measure. I take it to be one of the things, if not the main thing, implied by my philosophy, if I may so dignify it, that there is no one man anywhere, that there are countless men on all sides, in all countries, who contribute to the great result. Most of them, in fact, without a name, unknown, eclipsed by the formidable reputations of most lesser people. It's queer, sad, disconcerting how that goes. It can't be helped, but we should contribute nothing ourselves to such a falsifying human habit. When it comes to launching out into mathematics, tying philosophy to the multiplication table, I am lost, lost utterly. Let them all whack away. 
I am satisfied. If they can explain, let them explain. If they can explain, they can do more than I can do. I am not an anarchist, not Methodist, not anything you can name. Yet I see why all the ists and isms and haters and dogmatists exist. Can see why they must exist and why I must include all. We must not give too much importance to personalism. It is easy to overcharge it. Man moves as man in all the great achievements. Man in the great mass. Yet I, too, think of Lincoln much in that same way. As you say, his poise, his simple, loftiest ability to make an emergency sacred, meet every occasion, never shrinking, never failing, never hurrying. These are things to be remembered and things providential, if providence ever has a meaning in human affairs. People think an event consists of itself alone, but what event is there but involves a thousand elements scarcely dreamed of? We must not look back over our shoulders at the world. We should meet each day as it comes with the same assumption. We can make each new day the best of days if we get the habit. I love that, by the way. We can make each new day the best of days if we get the habit. Epicurus, all the big fellows, the sages, then, now, always, keep themselves free for new impressions, new lights. Look at Emerson saying, this is so-and-so, seems so-and-so to me today. What will happen tomorrow, I cannot tell. There was Darwin, too. I always put the two together, Emerson, Darwin. Darwin was sweetly, grandly, non-opinionative. We must be resigned, but not too much so. We must be calm, but not too calm. We must not give in, yet we must give in some. That is, we must grade our rebellion and our conformity both. Page 184. I remember that a long time ago, down at Timber Creek, I would go along the stream, looking, singing, reciting, reading, ruminating, and one fellow there, a splendid sapling, I would take in my hands, pull back so-and-so, and let it fly, as it did with a will into position again, its uprightness. One day I stopped in the exercise, the thought striking me, this is great amusement to me, I wonder if not as great to the sapling. It was fruitful, it was a fruitful pause. I never forgot it, nor answered it. I suppose this is a new strophe, Montaigne and other dress. I do not teach a definite philosophy. I have no cocked and prime system, but I outline, suggest, hint, tell what I see. Then each may make up the rest for himself. He who goes to my book expecting a cocked and prime philosophy will depart utterly disappointed and deserve to. I find anyhow that a great many of my readers credit my writings with things that do not attach to the writings themselves, but to the persons who read them, things they supply, bring with them. Epictetus says, do not let yourself be wrapped by phantasms, and we must not. This is very profound. It often comes back to me. Page 185. Epictetus is the one of all my old cronies who has lasted to this day without cutting a diminished figure in my perspective. He belongs with the best, the best of great teachers, is a universe in himself. He sets me free in a flood of light, of life, of vista. My contention is for the whole man, the whole corpus, not one member, not a leg, an arm, a belly alone, but the entire corpus, nothing left out of the account. I know it will be argued that the present is the time of specialization, but that don't answer it. So I hope you enjoyed my recording. I had great resistance in making it, but like all good art, you just have to roll with it and keep on going. But, um, you know, I want to say about Walt Whitman that I think he is a, uh, you know, definitely a transcendent individual. Uh, I'll be doing a lot more readings from him and uh, meditating, you know, on his words. But um, I think it's so appropriate. You know, he, he, made the, he, he wrote these words, you know, before the end of his life, and Walt Whitman speaks. And he wrote at a time when the Industrial Revolution was beginning, but he saw what was coming. And I think it's important to go back and look at what he, what he felt was coming at the time when so much was changing, when our consciousness was evolving before, and to see before what our consciousness looked like, and now to see our post-industrial age of, in, our, in the information age and see how post-modernity, you know, um, modernity, how we have been affected by the 20th century and by all the progress. I do not think, I do not believe in progress. 
I feel like what I've discovered in myself is you can only improve your own quality and you can only take responsibility for your own actions. And in so doing, you take responsibility for all of it. And, you know, there's a lot of opinions in the world today. Rumi said something I really think is beautiful. He said, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. I'm at the, I have come full circle in my own journey and I am bewildered. I am bewildered in the wilderness. I see the vast ocean of consciousness before us. What do you want to call that? God, you know, uh, the abyss, you know, I don't know. I don't know, but I know that I am bewildered by it and I've come beyond, to a place that is beyond words about it, my experience of it, and my words can only be an echo of it. And maybe now in my life, only now in this place, can I really make the art from my heart deep, the deepness, the deep de from the depths of my heart and echo that into the world and, and share the words from others that have influenced and affected me. Because like, Walt Whitman says, all you can do is point and hint and goad and tease. You can't directly confront people or ideas. Everyone has so many opinions. But what does it mean to sell your clever cleverness? That means to give up your opinions. And what does it mean to buy bewilderment? That means to put away the words and the books and to experience the world and to share your feeling of it as best you can, as clearly as you can. There's no need to obfuscate it any more than that than the mystery of consciousness already does. So I hope you will continue to walk with me for a time along my path, this journey, this ex these experiences. I'll do I'll be posting more as the fe as the feeling arises. You know, for me, success in living is no longer moment by moment or I don't have a goal. Success for me is breath by breath. Each breath is a new success, and each moment can be a celebration of that breath. And, you know, you've got to accept all of it. That's what Whitman, you know, says. His philosophy is a philosophy of all philosophies. It includes all philosophy, and I think that's really what it means to be enlightened, if you want to put a word on it. I wouldn't claim such myself, nor do I, but I will say I see gold and Whitman, I see gold in the Stoics. I see gold in Epictetus. Ironically, I also have come to love Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius and Seneca and other Stoics who have reminded me, you can't change the world. The, your suffering is only based in your thought of it and your thoughts of it. And what is thought? Well, let's look into what thought is over the next few months and weeks. Let's look into it. Let's look into ourselves. I will look into myself. What is my thought? What is my feeling? What is my experience? And now that I am mostly free of opinion, you know, and I can be in the moment and listen and watch it, you know, I'm very excited. It's a new conversation. It's a new way of being for me to not try to put my opinions into the world necessarily, but just to share the experience of them to share the experience of being here and the all of the ups and downs. You know, the wheel is going to turn and you're going to be up and you're going to be down, but to best that you can, we we you can find you can look you can try to rest in the center of it and and watch it all go by. How many songs have been written? How many poems have been written, you know, from folks that have come to the same place? Well, it took me a long time in my life. I'm almost 50 um to come to that point to see how the wheel turns and to be able to accept it as it is and myself as I am. And I think from that place, you can really spread out into the world. Your mind can really take it in and as with as little filter of your ego as possible, um, for your ego filtering as little as possible. And I think that's a special kind of experience. That's a spe that is maybe the best in life, the best way to live in life. And ultimately all my writings and all my sharing and my journaling is all just to kind of document how best shall we live? How best shall we live today? There is an anger rising in hearts. There is a, the country is headed for civil war in America. And you know, I feel Whitman reminding me and reminding us, don't forget the ancient language of the birds, the language of the heart, the language of love. That's the language of, of, of God. That's the language of God's. I don't know a God or God's. I know my consciousness and my experience, and that's all I know.
And that's really all any of us know. So we don't have to put more onto it. We don't need to, we don't need to project onto it. Although, you know, facing our fears, you know, is really the heart of life. And I think the biggest challenge in our life and ultimately our fear of death. And, you know, I've, I've tangled with death the last year. I've, I've been scared for my, for my life. Um, and I've come from the other side of that catalyzed because my will carried me beyond my fear. And now, I don't know, I feel open to things in a way I wasn't before and settled about things that I wasn't before. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not going to put meaning into that, but except to say for myself that, that exper- these experiences have been very meaningful to me. And, uh, you know, anyway, I think that's the best any artist can do is to share their feeling of the world and the time and space that they live and, uh, and let the chips fall where they may. Mm-hmm. <laughs>